see everybody on this uh, December Monday evening. Like I said before, we're getting to the end of Ongo. So this is our second to last Monday um, as we conclude our Ongo practice period. Talking about her? Okay. <clears throat> So it's, it's, um, it's always a time of transition. <laughs> Things are always changing every moment, you know, in a sense, we don't really know what's, what the next moment is going to bring. <laughs> this feels uh, especially uh, ripe period as we come into the, the winter uh, solstice period, we come to the conclusion of our ongo, come to the shortest day of the year coming up and kind of an intensification of our, of our being. <clears throat> so we've been looking at practicing non-knowing intimacy with self, other, and world. You know, these three dimensions of ourselves, three dimensions of ourselves, self, other, different aspects of the one body that we all are and really exploring this. So this will be the last public uh, talk I give in Ango. Uh, next Monday, we'll have our group sharing on how we're practicing with non-knowing world, okay, which has been the theme of our third trimester here. So we'll have a group sharing next Monday. And then we'll conclude with the Rahatsu uh, the following weekend. So I'll um, you know, share what has come to me about this uh, practice of non-knowing in the world in the hopes that uh, it might inspire your practice in, in these times. Reset. So the world, yeah. What's the world? It's the, it's the room we're in right now, okay? our immediate environment. This is the world. Yeah. It's our community. It's our society. It's our nation. It's our globe. It's our planet. <clears throat> Outside of our immediate sensory experience, okay, what we're experiencing right now in terms of this room and this environment, the, the greater world is, is um, while it's present with us, it's kind of mediated in a sense by our, our ideas, memories, our images, the information that we've received through newspapers, the media, photographs, accounts from other people. So all of that's present with us right now as part of our present experience. But the mediations are something that we can't um, ignore yeah so this will be this will be part of what we're bringing to our awareness and practicing non-knowing of the world is to bring our mediations to to consciousness to awareness you know to really look at it in the denger in the genjo koan dogen zenji share these words which many of you know but they never grow old to study Buddhism is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by myriad things. So this actualization is, is what Dogen referred to as, as enlightenment. And Joe Koan is talking about enlightenment and delusion and what that means and how he understands it. So this is just a part of it. 
to forget the self is to be actualized by myriad things. So what are myriad things, if not the world? Right? That's the world. <clears throat> the myriad things that come to us and that are present to us through our sensory experience and through our awareness. <clears throat> what if we flipped this around? Because as we've looked at this, we can see that self, other, and world are facets of the same one body, like I just said. So if that's true, then can we switch these terms around? To study Buddhism is to study the world. To study the world is to forget the world. To forget the world is to be actualized by the self. <clears throat> so the world is your experience of the world. That's all you have. Even your ideas and your images are something that you're experiencing right now. Right? It, it might seem obvious, you know, what I just said, the world is your experience of the world. Or another way to put it is there you have nothing but your experience of the world to understand the world. You can put it that way. So it might seem obvious, but it's actually very radical to fully internalize this radical, say, subjectivity of your experience of the world. It is only what you, it is only for you what you experience it as. <laughs> and any, any idea you have about other people's experience and whether it conforms to yours is just that, it's just an idea. It might be a conformant idea. It might have some alignment with uh, their experience. Nevertheless, it's your idea. So you have words and image and uh, ideas that are in your mind, in your awareness. Right? And do these come from outside of yourself, outside of your, say, brain, your body? Oh, yeah, of course they do. <laughs> they do. I'm not saying that, you know, we're all locked in our matrix pods and everything is an illusion completely, you know, a simulation. I know, I know there's this simula simulation theory and some people do believe it's all simulation, but it's a much bigger mind. That's not like an individual mind in that theory as far as I understand it, right? So, when we look at it, we see that images and words and sensations enter into our awareness and then they germinate within our own body minds and they yield additional images, words, concepts. It's this endlessly creative process that's going on within all of our body minds. So how sensations come in, ideas come in, words come in, images come in and then are transformed or germinate, I like that, germinate within your own experience to produce something new. What a, what a wonderful process, right, right at the heart of creative expression, which we've been, some of us have been doing work with in this past, uh, this past ongo period. It's ongoing creativity that's happening in each of our body minds right now, always, continuously. So what is this if not studying, studying the self is to look at how this germination is happening within us. 
this is how we're studying the world. What arises within you as you experience moment to moment other beings, including trees and flowers and plants, insects, people, mountains and rivers. <clears throat> so in this study, we're forgetting, we're forgetting the self or forgetting the world. So is this forgetting the non-knowing that we're practicing? This forgetting is the non-knowing that we're practicing. Dropping our preconceptions so that we can allow other conceptions to arise. It's being born within you. It's being conceived and born within you in each moment. Seated by the world. <clears throat> Forgetting the world means realizing the emptiness of the world. So when I say the emptiness of the world, I don't mean that trees and rocks and streams and other people don't exist. It means that none of those things exist as fixed entities, fixed things, which is how we normally understand them. They exist in a different way. They're in relation differently. The saying that the world is empty doesn't mean that power dynamics that don't exist, that institutions or cultural tendencies don't exist, that habits of harm don't exist. They most assuredly do exist. Saying that they're empty is saying that there's no mastermind behind pulling the strings. saying that karma is an unfolding at all dimensions of action, word, and thought, producing the phenomena that we call the world. So in order to be really intimate with all of this manifestation, we have to drop or forget our preconceptions about it. This is easier said than done. But we really have to recognize what our stories are about the world. Your ideas about the past and the future are just ideas mental conceptions. They may conform more or less. They may capture a small part within your understanding of karmic unfolding. Yeah, there might be some insight shed by your ideas, by your organizing principles. Yeah, valuable insights. But it's very important to recognize the partiality of all of those ideas. <clears throat> Forgetting the world means really seeing our projections upon the world. <laughs> so I had a nice um, interchange with, uh, with uh, Lisa Gakio this morning. Gakyo uh, was one of the, the crew that took care of our Zendo cat Lupe while I was out of town for a couple of weeks. And um, Lupe was well cared for 
by our support team. Thank you to Gakio and uh, Dave Corbis and, and Sokio with the other two, very appreciative. And um, Gakio's got experience with her own cats and, and we shared how oftentimes, you know, I'll, I'll come home from being away for a while and uh, Lupe will ignore me for a day or two. And Gakio has experienced this with, with her. He said, yeah, I, my, my cat would punish me for a day or two when I came back. <laughs> and of course I have experienced this, you know, with my cat, Lupe. And at the same time, you know, I know we both know that any idea of punishment was something we were adding to the experience. Nothing that I know of in my understanding of animal or feline psychology uh, suggests that there's any sense of punishment <laughs> as we understand it, that animals engage in, right? right? But how, how uh, common to, to think that, to anthropomorphize you know, an animal in that way, even while we're like with one part of our mind, we're like, of, of course, she's not. There's the other part that's, yes, she is, <laughs> right? Right, because it kind of it kind of fits. <laughs> yeah, but that's the kind of fit that that really distorts the reality, doesn't it? Right, because that's not a cat's experience. Almost certainly, I can't say for sure. <laughs> I can't say for sure, but you know, in all likelihood, it's 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 something more about you know trust, if you will, some kind of safety, right? It's like, oh, who are you that's come back here? And it's gonna take me a while to warm up to you and trust you, something like that. And even that I'm adding sort of human concepts. Yeah, so how, how often is that kind of projection, you know? And we use the word projection and then we think, oh, I understand what that is. Like projection is very subtle, very subtle and, and very um, unconscious. Yeah, when we, sometimes when we see our projections, it can be, whoa, wow, I was doing that, you know. Really see that someone was completely different from what we thought. We were convinced that somebody was uh, a certain way, acting in a certain way. Or, you know, can, convinced that the, the world is a certain way. That a whole group of people perhaps were um, engaged in, with uh, good intentions and it turns out they had bad intentions or vice versa. Maybe more often the former, right? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's almost, um, let's say inescapable. It's, it's, it's very uh, automatic to fill in the gaps of our understanding with our biases, with, with our knowingness, with our understanding of how things are, how people are, how the world is. And then to fill in those gaps of, of our understanding with that. But there's so many gaps. Mm -hmm. There's so many gaps. Can you really comprehend? Can you really be intimate? Are you really intimate with all the motivations, all the drives of all the beings? and all the groups in the world? No, you can't. Just, just uh, reflect on how much capacity is required to be intimate with just yourself and those in your life that you are intimate with, a partner, a family member perhaps. How much capacity, how much care, how much patience, how much real depth of understanding and non-reactivity you have to bring for those relationships to really be intimate. And now, you know, to think that you're that intimate with all other beings and groups. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it takes a lot. It takes, it takes a lot. So that, that's what is, is um, something that I'm pointing you to be mindful of. Mm. So we're so captivated by what we know that we, we miss the immensity 
of what we don't know. You've probably kind of contemplated this image of the, the greater the sphere of our knowledge, uh, the greater the surface area, which is the interface between what we know and what we don't know, <laughs> right? So if what we don't know is space, and then what we know is this kind of accumulation of more, more and more knowledge. Well, the surface of that sphere is growing. It means our contact points with the unknown grow with all of our knowings. Yeah, so we have to open up to the world in that way, understanding that the mystery deepens, the immensity <laughs> makes itself more present to us. The vastness becomes more of a felt reality in their lives. This is one flavor of the experience of emptiness. What does that feel like? The experience of being actualized by the myriad things, of being actualized by the self. So I'm, I'm gonna offer a few kind of descriptions, but they're relative descriptions, right? Because all experiences are relative and all descriptions are relative. So just with a grain of salt, just, just take my next words. So our, our normal conditioned way of experiencing self and world has a certain fixity to it, a certain kind of um, subject object relationship, if you will, to use that phraseology, right? There's me and then there's things and then I'm experiencing those things. <clears throat> but in emptiness, in actualization, we can say that all things are being experienced through the self, not by the self. It's kind of echoes what I was saying right at the beginning, how we are germinated and seeded by the world as we co-create the world. Right. So this experience from the standpoint of kind of normal experience, normal, ordinary, experience it's it's unstable okay until we acclimate to it it can feel unstable it's in movement it's very fluid it's also profoundly connected <clears throat> and in this experience of, of the emptiness of the world Unseen, previously unseen dependencies and interconnections make themselves available to your awareness. Open, open, open. So practicing not knowing the world is to continue to turn ourselves to an experience of the emptiness of the world. To take a posture towards the world that's comfortable with ambiguity, that's comfortable with movement and fluidity, with changing perspectives and changing truths. Taking a posture towards the world that's comfortable with contradiction paradox, two opposing things being true at the same time. So we have to take this posture towards the world as towards ourselves if we wanna progress in our spiritual understanding. Some of you maybe um, 
were present for or heard uh, Schoen's talk last week, uh, which I listened to and enjoyed very much. He, he mentioned um, being present to the truth of, um, say, the Rohingya in Myanmar, as well as to the perpetrators, the genocide, you know, in Myanmar. And that's the that's what we're called to do in practicing non-knowing towards others, you know, really bringing a non-judgmental openness to really try to understand and be with. Which which doesn't mean you don't bring a discriminating conscience <laughs> to things. Of course not, but is to be humble. Yeah, so I saw where, I think it was just this morning that, that Aung San Suu Kyi was sentenced perhaps to four years in prison, I think. And you know, Aung San Suu Kyi is this, this figure who's gone through these wild swings of you know, being an amazing advocate for democracy and human rights in Myanmar, and then being jailed, and then coming to power, and then being accused of abusing that power. And now once again, being jailed for her, you know, going against the military as, as far as I understand. So, I, we, we can't be quick to judge. Right? I mean, Aung San Suu Kyi was a, was a heroine of mine, you know, prior to the last few years with, with what was going on in Myanmar. And then I was, I was you know, heartbroken and confused when it appeared that she was uh, in some ways, you know, complicit with the genocide that was going there, or at least supporting or at least not talking. You know. And you know, now she's on the other side of things. So we have to be humble. We can't turn away from the world and its abuses. You also have to be very, you know, humble and uh, not jumping to, to conclusions about right and wrong, because that's oftentimes a resting place for us where we can take respite, the task of showing up for the world in accordance with our vows. That's something that Schoen said as well. He said, don't look away, care. And then for him, at least, it was speaking the truth. Right? What's the truth? Speak your truth. That's all we can do, really, is speak our truth. <clears throat> the Zen peacemaker tenets are not knowing, bearing witness, and then taking action. The speaking truth is Shoin's action. You know, he's, he's got a, a lot of other actions that he does from those vows, from those tenets, you know, other activist type work. And that's the one he mentioned explicitly last week. But ultimately, it's about manifesting and taking care of this one body. That's what the intimacy is leading us towards. So not knowing, bearing witness, and taking action. Not knowing, that's the forgetting. Bearing witness, that's the studying. And taking action is behaving, speaking, and even thinking from that place. That is the actualization. Study the self, forget the self, be actualized by the world. Study the world, forget the world. 
be actualized by the self. Every day. <laughs> Every day. Because our practice is this study, this study, this study. Forgetting, 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 dropping the ideas, dropping the ideas. Be fully present. Fully present to yourself, what's going on, to others, what they're showing up with, and to the world as it presents itself to you. Mediated or unmediated. It's presenting itself to you. Show up. Experience directly with your whole heart. And then what you do is your actualization of your nature. The deepest level, the most caring level, the most open level, that's Buddha nature. And that's your true self. You'll practice like this. <laughs>